Welcome, BBCs, to episode number 175 of the Solo Q Educational and Motivational Podcast. Curtis, today we're going to be starting off with a tweet. This is from Gurun Lol. We've talked about Gurun a lot on this podcast, especially he's got a lot of popularity, hit him, hit him rank one in Korea a while ago with a very specific sort of way of different view of early game junglers. Full clear jungling, you had the whole, you know, shenanigans with the proactive versus reactive jungling argument. Um, and you'd say, would you agree that Aguran's probably one of the best solo queue players that we've probably seen? I think probably one of the best solo queue players in the world. In the world. Cross role, you know, rank one, EU, Korea, def- and, and does it in a way that's replicable. Like he can, he can actually explain what he's doing mm. very art- mm. articulately. Mm. Probably one of my favorite league personalities and content creators out there. Very consistent rank one player. He's not just like a flash in the pan. Very, very good. Consistent. And pretty consistent with his champs that he's known for as well. The Karzix and all that sort of stuff. Elise. All right. So for context, he's done his second career trip. So the last career trip, he was, you know, got the rank one, got all that, you know, publicity, that sort of stuff. And then this is a tweet that came out three days ago from the time. When was, when, do you know when his last career bootcamp was? Like the most recent one? Um, oh, this is literally weeks in the last couple of weeks. Oh, okay. He's like, he's like, yeah, popped up like the last two, three weeks. Right. I see a tweet on November 13th. I've decided to stop climbing. The motivation I once has once had has faded in the past few days and I'm not feeling very well. It could be because I haven't seen the sun in weeks. I'm not eating properly or this small room is making me feel lonely. Thanks to everyone who participated in the journey. Even though I reached over 1K, it feels like a big failure. I couldn't figure out how to live and how to play. GG. So there's a couple of angles we can approach to this. The most obvious one is what we talk a lot about this podcast. You got to fix your out of life sort of stuff to be able to perform on the rift. And it seems like just going back to the really basic stage four, just not feeling, just not healthy, you know? You know... I had a discussion with Central in one of my recent YouTube videos about his journey from Master to Challenger. And he rewatched that episode where we, um, you mentioned about Will, your coaching client. And Will, when he was, when you coached him to rank one, there was a quote that you mentioned he lived by, which was, if I don't feel like a beast off the rift, I can't feel like a beast on the rift. Hmm. And I, and that was that's the quote that resonated with Central. When he doesn't feel on point and he doesn't feel confident in his real life, how the hell can you expect yourself to perform on the rift? And I think for Agurin's case in Korea, you know, if you don't have your sleep down right, you're not getting vitamin D, you're not eating well, you're not probably exercising, everything's going to come crumbling down at some point. It's not sustainable. And we know, and what I think I want to, the way I kind of view this is we've done Korean boot camps. Now, not like that. We haven't been the ones playing the whole time. Like, I, at least from my perspective, I've been doing. You've I mean, been doing I could, I could managing say, stuff. I've never properly done it. You've never, weekend, but you, yeah. you've kind of been in that environment yeah, in another country yeah, in a small, small room, room yeah. you know, all that sort of thing. I've been watching a trillion scrims and watching people solo queue for that entire duration. Going to a foreign country where English is not the the kind of primary language, and especially when you're in a setup that isn't ideal, like you're trying to do it on the cheap in a small room. You've got a PC, you've got a bed, you've got a kitchenette. And especially the cuisine as well, finding good quality food, it wears you down. It really, really, really wears you down. So I 100% empathize with that situation. And I, can, I can't even imagine what that would be like to be alone as well, being alone in that situation. I was with other people in, in Diables at that time. Even that was mentally taxing. After a month in Korea, I wanted to get the hell out of there. But doing it by yourself, that's, you know, mental asylum level stuff right there. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, the, another, two, another, the big, the main angle that I sort of want to approach this mm. is he, that first line, I've decided to stop climbing, right? I think this really takes like a level of awareness that if, okay, if I keep doing this, I can't brute force it. Like I'm actually going to create really bad narratives around the game because I'm just not going to be at my best. And I'm actually going to ruin my relationship with the game. Mm. Like being aware, like, okay, I need to stop. Like I need to stop, you know, climb even just like, you know, stop the game for a while. I think that's really important. Sort of, I view it sort of like a professional mindset of like, I know that if I keep going down this route, I'm going to destroy my relationship with the game. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really, it's really refreshing to see this as well from a content creator like that. You know, he's ultimately, you know, taking a break for him. And you got to remember from the outside, this is his career. Like streaming is his income stream. Like mm. theoretically, if we're, if we're going to really 
looking at it as what it is. Obviously, he loves the game and he's playing. As, he's playing to to climb, but ultimately, it's also his 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 livelihood. Yeah, maintaining the reputation as the one of the best Oliki players, right? And that's why people kind of tune into a stream and watch his content, right? Mm. So, um, yeah, you know, you're absolutely spot on, and I feel like. It's a very mature thing to do. And a lot, a lot of people in his situation probably wouldn't have done that. They would have gone there, grinded their ass off, uh, started losing a lot of games, developed a poor relationship with the game. And we see that time and time again with content creators. I want to refer back to XFS and Saber, him kind of playing a lot of League and slowly kind of creating a hatred yes. for the game and mm. despising the game mm. to the point where he actually had to quit the game. And maybe, just maybe, a groom would have, would have or could, could still very well go down that same route. Um, so yeah, I think yeah, that's a really interesting point. It's, I think it's a very mature thing to do. Um, yeah. But yeah, the outside of game is just so important. You know, sleep, having not even just a, um, like a clean environment, but an environment that you control, you know? Mm. And I think that's the, he and he might be a bit of a certain case of like, you know, going to different places a lot of the time. I mean, just for me as well, like, especially when you're going out to eat food all the time, dude, just like you know, the certain grease and stuff of food, you know, it's just, yeah, it's not good. Ul yeah. Ultimately. And, and, and I would say as well, like, you know, I think taking a break and feeling very comfortable in your environment is hard to do when you're in another country, because like, where do you go? If you're unfamiliar with your environment, you know, you don't, it's, it's very hard. Yeah. Sure. You might say sightseeing or whatever, but it's different. You're not really, really relaxed mm. when you're in your, and you're in your own country as well, you know, and you're at home, you know your environment, you know your family's probably nearby or your friends you can always catch up with. But if you're in a foreign country and you have quote unquote downtime and you're probably in a small little room, right? What do you, what is your relaxation really? It, it's very, I can imagine it being very difficult to actually unwind because you would always feel the guilt. I'm here overseas. I've went all this, I've, went, I've taken all this time and money to come over here. He's pro imagine the pressure as well that would be on him to even just play solo. He's probably like sitting there. You can see he's probably PC in the corner of the room. Mm. He's probably thinking, Hmm, should I be playing? And, then, and it would be so hard for him to kind of really come to terms with that. So yeah, I don't really envy that position. I'll be honest with you. Remember John always talked about the importance of controlling your environment mm. and he would like do like little things like really like move shit around and stuff like that. Like he's like it... when you go somewhere, like unpack your suitcase and use the drawers and wardrobes, like actually yes. unpack your clothes. Yeah. That was, an, that was one. That was one for us. I thought that, that was a really interesting take. It was an and interesting it felt, take. It felt, the the controlling of environment I think is, is really important. You know, this is why I think that a lot of the time you see, especially with like pro players and stuff like imports and stuff like that come to, they just sometimes just don't perform the, mm. the way because it's just such a, they don't feel like they control the environment. It's not so much like maybe it's the language and stuff like that, but I think that's mm. the main thing. It's like, this is, I just don't feel this feel is my home. environment. I think that's part of the reason Fake has had so much success. Mm. He has full control over his environment. He's Korea, Korean, lives in Korea. Same organization. Same as organization. Well. Same thing. Like that would just be his hmm. environment permanently, right? He's not moving to another team, different management, all that sort of stuff, you know? So I think that's actually a huge hmm. reason as well why Fakers had so much success. Yeah, I'd have to think about that some more. That's something I haven't really thought about before. Maybe there is something to that simply just staying in a similar situation. I mean, you know, I guess for all of us here, even sitting on the, the playing in the same PC, in the same room. Right, I mean, Dopa famously had the same mouse and same keyboards and measured the distance, measured the, the distance, desk and did the height, the monitor height, and stuff like that. Yeah, there's something, definitely something there. Love it. All right, next topic, Curtis. Um, now I'm very curious in your program when you do your coaching. Do you ever, do you ever use mini games to describe particular aspects of the game? What's an example? So, okay. Um, <laughs> I talk a lot about Meiji Mage matchups being a miniature game of dodgeball, right? To get across the point that, you know, you need to actively be focused on not only hitting your abilities, but dodging their abilities to get across that it is a mini game. Ultimately, if you're playing Syndra versus Orianna or Orianna versus Victor or Lux versus whatever, whatever the Mage V matchup, Mage V Mage matchup is, it is inherently some sort of miniature game of dodgeball. And I like to use that kind of mini game, I guess whatever you know coaching technique like kind of using that that i guess metaphor or analogy because it gets people in the mindset of knowing okay what is exactly they're here to do like it cuts the bullshit it's like okay this is what this aspect of the game is right and it gives them something to kind of orient around another one is actually i use the the um the framework of boxing a lot because in in mid lane in laning typically 
you know, it's very rare that you have even range champions. Usually one champion outranges the other champion. So for example, let's say I'm playing um, Vex into Lux, right? The, one of the main reasons that matchup is so annoying for Vex is because Lux outranges, right? So it's, or you're playing even Vex into a Zerath. Like they just have higher range abilities. Now the reason, and the, the reason I like to kind of use the metaphor or the minigame of like kind of a boxing match is that imagine if you're the shorter ranged boxer, right? You can't just walk in there swinging you got to actively try and avoid or bait out or, you know, evoke a response from them first to, to kind of, in order to close the range to get into them. Because if you're outranged, you need to focus first and foremost on avoiding their abilities first, then counter punching or making a counter trade. You know what I mean? So, and that's why I like using boxing. Because if you're lo if you're the longer range person, you don't need to worry too much about that. You can be the proactive one in your ability usage because you're the one that outranges them. But if you're the other on the other side of the coin, you need to try and think about okay, I need to avoid their damage first, then I can maneuver and make my counter punch. So that's like another again that's little cool. kind of well, mini like game. That. Yeah, mini games. Or do you, you know? Or do you have like Not kind really. of really? I have a closest maybe i do i can't remember the closest thing i can think of is more about like item spikes like mm. i i have this one with the udi called operation demonic embrace because getting that first item because you're you're the yeah. components and it's so shit for demonic embrace yeah. rush right so you're like you're not really come online until you have demonic embrace even just clearing our camps and stuff so i say you know this is what our goal is how can we get demonic embrace that's the mm. mini game i guess we're playing mm. for mm. items this would be the same with like hecarim as well like a lot of champs that like need items to come online in the jungle mm. But yeah, no, maybe maybe that's something I could think of as well. Some more Cause, cause, game analogies. You know, I think back I like to them. you know, it's something that I'm trying to explore more, integrate more into my coaching. And the reason, you know, I feel like, or the reason I know it's such an effective tool is that, you know, we do guides, right? And if you think back to your most pragmatic guides, mm. remember what you always used to say? You used to say, "My Olaf guide." I think it was your Olaf guide, your Eve guide, or whatever. Guide, yeah. The guides that were just really just one game plan. It's like, it's like, this is one mini game kind of like, this is all you do. do yeah. And like, it's, I'm not saying that's everything about the champion, but it gives them a really good kind of like starting point to feel out what the champion or what this part of the game is really about. And you remember the, all the comments you used to get on people who watch your, your Olaf guide were like, you know, this is great. I climbed up so much just from watching the guide because well, I had just for doing that specific that early specific game specific thing. And the yeah. same with my Echo guide back yeah. in the day. I had this like thing with the mini game, which is yeah, like getting to this item. Okay, you got to base on this wave, use these D mats, get to this item, then boom. It's like it's like a kind of a, this boom, very clean black and white. It's like create. It's like brute forcing a black and white esque view of the game. Yeah, it was brute. Yeah, which is what we don't really do much which, in league. Exactly, it's, we don't really want that. Yeah, but but I think it's an underutilized coaching technique because, yeah. or just a technique for learning in general because. We, as we know, league is a game of gray area. Everything is everything is specific. Everything is nuanced. Everything is you know tailored to that game that you're in. But you know, I sometimes view it as like a really great way to learn the basics of a particular element of the game, even though it's not sustainable in the long run. It's like a really good, uh, it's a it's, great starting point. It's like it's you know yeah. what the what it, what it's similar to is like you know when um it's like bowling. You know, there's that when you're a kid and you have like that little stand and you mm. roll the ball. It's like, or the gutters, or like you put up the gutters and it's like, okay, well, I'm still getting the feel of throwing the bowling ball, you know, but it's like an extra little bit of help. And, you know, it's not obviously not sustainable in the long run, but it gives me the feel of how to throw a bowling ball. You know what I mean? And then later on, we can remove them. We can, we stop doing this gameplay. We can add a little bit more nuance, yeah. push down the gutter, the, yeah. the barriers or whatever on the side of the lanes. Yeah. And then we can actually play real, real, uh, real bowling. Yeah. Yeah. No, I mean, uh, the game... Yeah, it's just the more I play, it's just the more we just got to adapt, 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 right? Like it's black and white rules are just so hard, it's especially hard. It's when hard. it's for jungle. You know, people talk all the way, or like people love talking about this is the way this matchup works, or this bounce right. way back, but it's just, that's just like, right, you got to be adaptable. Out. You got to be adaptable. The closest thing is like <laughs> for most champs is yeah, just get level four first and then, right. but then it's not black because then it's like, there's all these different sequences that then happen. It's like, what happens if you're matching the enemy jungle? What happens if the lane you're passing towards right. is watered early? So what maybe it's not, it, so, so you're saying that like that way of teaching that you did before with the Olaf, you wouldn't do that Well, the anymore. Olaf, the Olaf this was is very so specific. unique because he was so strong early. There was no counterplay. Like, right. So that was like a very walk around thing. and do whatever the f you wanted, right? Right. right. Interesting. There's just so little, which is so rare. Mm. You don't really, you rarely have a champion that is able to, especially at that point in time, you could full clear. That was like one of the first, like you would full clear, but you're also insanely strong. Right. 
Right, that didn't exist back then. Right, interesting. Yeah, so something I'm going to have a think about anyway. Maybe you're right. Maybe it's just completely useless, but I don't know. I just feel like it's something that a lot of my clients resonate with. Yeah, mini games are cool. Mini games are cool. Again, I just have it for items more so. I want to talk about um, micro problems for a second. Micro, God, that's that's. And this is where I feel like I dis, I mean, you differ a lot. Yeah. Okay, and so. Okay, I, I, I want to say... I, so, the, the weight of micro problems? What do you mean by no, the No, so I, I just think that me and you have a fundamentally different approach to fixing like problems. You, like, or what even is a micro problem? Yeah. That's why I want to get into this discussion okay. with you, okay? Okay. So, all right. I've watched, a, you know, with your coaching, mm. you know, you'll talk a lot about, you know, Samuli, I think he plays Nidalee. Nidalee yeah. And I just disagree with your approach. Yeah. To, to, to fixing micro problems. So, I, I don't even think I have an approach. Right. Okay. Let, let's talk about this. Because I think yeah. that, correct me if I'm wrong, your current quote unquote approach is just get in the repetitions. Yeah. You know, keep doing have it. Have a general idea of like, okay, I, I, when micro, I, keep, I sort of think about, okay, how do you want to use your abilities? There's more so. Great. So it's like a great example is like Hecarami, which which I have different versions of like the way you want to fight. It's like, do we start with a big R? Do we start with them walking into us and just phase rush? And then we then we hold our E, then we E. So I right. talk general about general philosophies like, about how, how to, to use... use the abilities in fights. Great. That's, yeah. I think that's really good. I don't yeah. have a problem with that. Yeah. I think that's really important. I just think that a lot of people think they have mechanical problems or quote unquote micro mechanical problems when mm. they don't at all. My argument is that 90% of, let's say, ability usage problems, like let's say, including in this miss skill shots, getting hit by skill shots, all this sort of thing, is actually nothing to do with clicking, reaction times, anything at all. It's all anticipation, mm. all anticipation. Mm. So like like that 90%. And so I had a review this week and it was a, a Syndra guy. He came in playing Syndra and he said, Curtis, my micro is just atrocious. My, my, I miss all my Syndra E's. And he was really frustrated because he's like, he felt like he was capped mechanically. He felt like he was gated. It felt like he, he came into the review thinking, I, I he felt really helpless and defeated. It's like, I, I keep saying I'm missing my E's. I know I'm losing games off missing my E's. I'm just at a loss. I don't even know how to fix it. Right, and then I'm like, okay, I'm gonna keep an open mind. I'm gonna look into these these details, right? And there was a situation where he saw the enemy mid jungle starting dragon. Okay, he's at around the dot bush. They don't see him. Okay, they're just hitting the dragon. There's no ward in the pit, so he doesn't really see. He knows they're in the pit doing the dragon, but he can't see them doing the dragon. He walks over outside the dragon pit, wards inside the pit. And then, th- and then sees them both hitting the dragon, throws his QE to try and hit the sun onto the, onto the jungle. Mm. And the Graves just like walks away and he just misses the combo. Yeah. And then they just do dragon from his face. <laughs> yeah. And then, and he's like yeah. saying, if I just land this QE, I can kill the jungler. They don't do dragon. The game's just completely different. Yeah. I'm like, I totally agree. Yeah. And what I said to him, I said, this is not a mechanical problem. This is nothing to do with micro mechanics. And what I said, I said, okay. I want you to look at this situation through Graves' lens. Graves was with the jungler on the dragon. If you're playing Graves and you see a random ward pop up in the pit, are you just going to stand there? Are you going to sit there auto-attacking that dragon? No, you're going to probably step back or E back or you're going to do, you're going to have some sort of the, response. You're, on the, you're in the anticipation mode. You're, the Graves would be in the defense right. mindset. Exactly. You, you're going to, you're going to, you're going to move, you're going to move in some way, yeah. shape or form, right? We don't know where he's going to move, but he's probably going to move somewhere, right? So therefore, knowing that as a Syndra, if I ward that pit, of course, I'm never going to go for a QE. The only scenario where I would QE is if, if I knew that I was off vision and I know there's no way yeah, they so could react to it. So you're using the fog of war concept. Right. Yeah, so my, that's, that's, a, that's a part of micro, right? Fog, was, that, was that where you... No, no, no. My, my point here micro? is that... What's the, what's the my, point My point here is that the reason he threw his QE is yeah. because he didn't know how Graves would respond in this situation. Okay. It's nothing to do with his ability or, or non-ability to hit the QE. That's right. Yes. Right? And if I'm you like, break it down, that's what so it if is. You actually, if yeah. you actually break down 90% of my... Of like, this is when I look at your client, Samoli's Nidalee. His cues. His cues aren't because he has randomly, just randomly missing cues. That's actually such a, it's actually not the case whatsoever. Yeah, of course he's trying to hit them. Samoli's problem. No, it's not even, it's not that he's not even trying to hit them. It's just that 
it's not a clicking or accuracy or problem. It's that he he's not viewing the game through the enemy person's lens. He actually hasn't gone back in the review to be like, you know what? If I was that that Oriana here, what would I do? How would I be moving? How would I be moving? Yeah. Why would I move like yeah, that? Yeah. What would be the... And then you ask yourself the question after that. What would be the most annoying thing for me to do in terms of how... I, like, what's the most annoying way for me to use my ability? And so we go through all these situations in the game and most of them were just, again, anticipation problems. They were not mechanical problems at all. I'm like, your mechanical level is completely fine. You have the ability to be a high grandmaster level mechanical player, even though he's sitting D4 at the moment. And I just completely changed his entire view on, on that problem. And so, you know, I think the reason I want to raise this is that I think most people listening who think they're terrible at hitting skill shots, take a second to look again. Ask yourself that question when you're looking at that scenario. If I knew, if I could put myself in their shoes, if, if I was them, what would I do? And if you ask yourself that question, it becomes painstakingly obvious how you would change the way you're fundamentally using your abilities. Your abilities, yeah, based on their movement and how you would move, yeah. That's right. You're not like reacting to their movement. It's again, it, league is, it really is. What's the, what's your ratio code? Is it 80% anticipation or 90%? I think it's 90%. It's, it's 90%. Up. It is, isn't it's it? It's not that, like, league is, is only like, yeah, sure, there are like, look, I'm not saying everyone is on the equal footing mechanically, right? In terms of clicking and tethering, tethering yeah. and all that. I'm not saying that, but I, I I will say a lot of it, a lot of if you can if you can if you have control over your character and you know how to confidently like cast your abilities, you know your ranges, you can control your mouse, and you're like baseline average at like low dodge game, you can get to a high level in league, like very high level, like mechanically. That's not the thing holding you back. And, and I just think that a lot of people think it is, but it's not, they haven't taken the time to, they, it's like, it's like having intention with your abilities, but your intention is twofold. And this is the time back to the, you know, the, the, the analogies and the metaphors. I, I, I think of casting abilities in league, like, like a dance, like the tango, it's a true person thing. The man, the man in the, doing the tango is doing things. And then the woman in the tango is doing things. It's not that they're true in it. They, 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 they're like both. They're like two independent entities and they're interacting they with each together. other. Yeah. yeah, like it's not just like I do this, they do that. It's like it's like an interplay between two things. It's like that's the way you've got to view ability usage. You're interacting with another human at the end of the day. So you have to view it like there's another human on the other side, you know, maneuvering their character. Mm. And and then and then people say, But I'm never gonna be in this situation again. And that's where the repetitions come into play. If you are if you're playing Nidley, again, smallly playing Nidley, and I you throw this spear and you miss the spear, and then you, you actually, in the review, are genuinely curious about like why they were able to respond that way, why they moved that way, and what you, what you could have, how, how should you have used your skill shot? If you actually asked that, do that, and you do that for two months, you would, be, you would see night and day difference in his his. his yeah, you're his just only usage. looking at skirmishing, your bloody usage, you, hidden, right. yeah, hidden skill shots. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. You ask that question, and you go through the process, you would be a completely different player. Yeah. Straight up. That's my belief. Yep, I'm going to deep dive into micro probably early next year because I have like sections in my I'm redoing it on mm. my soul too, like the fundamentals and sort mm. of stuff. And I'm just going to have a pure just dodging skill shots, you know, um, you know, kitten skill anticipation. shots. Yeah, anticipation. And I think this is especially important for you, Nathan, as I've a been, jungler. I've been focused a lot more on like fog of war recently. Right. Because the general thing that I see a lot of people do, how they play, a fight happens and they just, they just put their body in the fight, you know, versus thinking about... Mm. How can I use my abilities out of Fog of War? Like, that's my number one priority most right, of the time. Right, Fog of War, interesting. Fog of War, I find, is really, especially as a jungler, mm. is is a huge part in my eyes of having good micro, using Fog of War to your advantage. But a lot of people don't think about it, because remember, people don't think about what the enemy's seen on their screen. Mm. It's the same thing, right? Mm. Yeah, it's, a, it's a similar, it's an extension of that 100%. And the other tools that I have in my kit as well is... Um, yeah, aiming at their feet for micro. Yeah, you know, I've never done that. <laughs> I've that. never done that. You should try to it. It works well. I've never done that. That's interesting. Maybe, maybe, maybe it's. Uh, I'm, I'm not saying you don't need it, but yeah. I'm, and it could be helpful. I'm just saying I've never, I've never done that personally. But aim at the character model's feet. I've had people had a lot of success with that. Really interesting. And then the thing of like controlling your character, click closer to your character. Yeah. That's you know, it's funny when we talk about this example. Did I send you that clip with the Philip? Like, 
No. I think I showed you it of like anticipation, like he was anticipating the, a Morgana cue, right? Mm. And he moved into it. Mm. So it's like, how do you explain that for anticipation? And he literally says, like, we even said it before. Right. We're doing a live coaching. We right. even said it before. It's like, okay, all you have to do is dodge this Morgana cue. And he's like, well, he's like I, intentionally I, I'll, I'll like looking to, look to dodge it. it. Well, I'll, I'll, have to, I'll have to look at it again because it can be many things, right? Yeah. It can be... Okay, well, then let's go a bit deeper then. He he can... I'm thinking more now, like, where is where do you look? Yeah, where's his attention Like, focus? where do you look? Do you look at your character or their character, Q? So I had a review this morning with a silver Vex player. Because I don't know what I do. Where do you look when you dodge his characters? You look you at do, your you model do, you or do. the enemy model? I actually... Yeah, I look in, like, a lot of the time using my peripheral vision. It's peripheral, is it's it? It's peripheral vision. Like, okay. I'm, I'm like... I feel like sometimes when I play League, I'm like, I'm not actually looking at a specific area or like I'm looking at my character, but I'm not really focused on my character. Interesting. I'm yeah, using like my, yeah, yeah, I'm like yeah, using yeah. my peripheral vision a yeah. lot. But I will say, no, I mean, a lot of the time actually, I would say it's just a, a really constant flickering between my character and then, um, and then the enemy. You know what we should do is the do the eye tracker, eye tracker yes, and, do a, and do a BBC episode yes, on that. Yes. Because you can look at it from the jungle to see how yes. you're pro, what you're looking at. Yes. And then what I'm doing in like team fights fight. and stuff. Yeah, fights. That's how you get into micro. That would be really... But yeah, and I think that with that guy in that situation, the first thing that would come to me, because this is why I saw him my this morning coaching, is that a, 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 a uh, Lux Q was coming out, but he'd already... He was only looking at his character and he'd already decided where he was going to move before... Like as the projectile was moving, he's just still moving in that direction. It's like he's like, if I just click rapidly enough, I, ho I hopefully I'm gonna dodge yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, I think that's what happened. With I think that's Flop what he well. thinks. He's not actually, yeah, he's trying, not actually to dodge. trying to dodge. He's, he's just, just trying to play the odds of like if I <laughs> yeah. if I dodge if I click <laughs> randomly in random directions, maybe it's not gonna hit I me. Know it's, I know the skill shots come in, but like I'll just yeah. But that's I'm where LOL dodge it. game is so important. Yeah, LOL dodge game teaches that skill because in LOL dodge game you you can't just focus on your character and your mm, model because yeah. you won't you just get hit by fight. You got to actually look on the screen and see where they're coming, and you got to get comfortable knowing where your character is in reference to all the fireballs coming at you that's why i actually have in my blow pipe program um a big thing on low dodge game we have like a leaderboard and everything like i think it's really really important to get the feel of peripheral yeah, vision i need we need to get in, i need to get into that i'm gonna go on a micro binge, binge even for myself yeah. as well because my micro sucks obviously that's what I'm, I'm not i'm not known for having a micro so i gotta work on that yeah, and yours is mind-boggling though. I don't, <laughs> <laughs> yours is because you should have the anticipation down pat. That's yeah. what, so yours is... I feel like yours is just no, laziness, no, you, it's, complacency. It's, it's, it's a disrespect for it. It really is. <laughs> I have a disrespect for micro because I've won so many games without, without having needing to it, it, right? I've gone to challenge without having to need it. So think about what that's done. The right. In my like brain, you just right? don't think it's that important. Yeah, I don't think it's that important, but it's exceptionally important. I know it is, but subconsciously, I don't so think it's it like is. It's like self-sabotaging. I yeah. feel like, no, I feel like it's a chip on your shoulder where like, you don't want to feel like you have to be good mechanically. Like you want to be so good with your decision, decision making, making yeah. that it overrides having to like outplay people. Because like, that's not the part of the game that you enjoy. No. You enjoy the, you know, everything else, but like the macro and being in the right place and outplaying people like, like, reading where they're going to be yep. and yep. win conditions and all like yeah. you want to win Fuggable. it every other way, but having to rely micro, on, yeah. on micro. Yeah. Cause that was never really, it's never been something I've even focused on again. My coach. No, no. And, and look, to be fair, as a jungler, that other stuff is more important. I, I think straight up. I think you're, cor you're correct in saying that. Yeah. Like as the jungle role, mm. the jungle role, look fundamentally, right. The jungle role is about many of these other cerebral things, right? right. Like, yes. like, skirmishing and you know hitting your skill shots is it's definitely important but it's not as important as these other things i would argue yeah i guess it depends what champion you're again it depends right. on the champion you play yeah. if you play in italy then it's incredibly important yeah you know <laughs> um and then i want to talk about here quickly okay so i um actually sorry before we move on yeah people ask about lol dodge game mm. Do you want to do a quick little guide about how to get the LOL Dodge game? Because some people aren't going to know what it is. So it's loldodgegame.com and what are the settings? Yeah, loldodgegame.com and then you go skill shot and then you go skill shot and dodge. Skill shot and dodge and then you go hard. Got it. Yeah. Not not ranked, whatever. It's just the hard one. The hard, yeah, hard yeah. setting. The hard setting. That's what I do. Done. And you can't use flash. Yeah, not allowed to use flash. Yeah, you just have to click. That's right. And shoot. Things. I have a video on my YouTube about it if you're interested. Okay, so that's type in what? Coach Curtis, um, LOL Dodge game? I'm sure that will come up Lol Dodge Game if you type in Coach Curtis Lol Dodge Game. So I actually feel like I, I did a little bit of accidental therapy therapy today without even realizing it. And I actually, like I was doing it in the middle of the session and I felt like I was 
like a therapist, like an unprofessional, obviously therapist. Yeah, an amateur know? therapist. And I want to talk about this, like this this little exercise I did. Okay, so a client came in and he gave this rev- he gave this vod, and it was just basic basic mistakes. And this is a master tier client, right? And that's always a red flag. If someone comes in and they and they send you a vod that's like, oh, right, here we go, I died to a level three gank or whatever there it is. It's like they already know what I'm going to say. If you're at this level of play, you should already know that this is an end of review mistake. You should already know, you should already know how to review it. So that in itself, and then we've had this discussion before, the, the VOD they send ring, yeah. gives you a lot of information, okay? Yeah, so why would he send that? Why he already he knows how that? to problem solve this. Right, and, and, and look, we got into the, started getting into the master specifics, whatever, we did all that. And then I said to him, I'm like, okay, man. I said, what is really bothering you? Like, I'm like, what, like, what is, because he said I just get really like frustrated and, and in my games and I'm like, okay. And so what are you frustrated about? And, and then I said, okay, we're going to go through an exercise here. So imagine we're on the Titanic and you see the tip of an iceberg here. The way you want to view it is that the tip of the iceberg is the initial emotion. Okay. So you just see the tip. That is the initial emotions. If you're feeling frustrated, you're feeling angry. You can see it in the facial expression. You can feel it in the vibe, the energy. And, even, and this is it. the same thing in your own reviews. Like if you if you get vi- there's like you have a visceral response, like there's a big negative response to something. Yeah, great. Boom. You've done step number one, which is you've noticed that there's an iceberg and you're approaching that iceberg. There's just a, there's the tip of the iceberg there, right? But I said, all right, let's do let's go a little bit deeper. Let's let's poke our head underwater for a second. Like, oh shit, this thing's bigger than we thought. Okay. And then we got to go to the next layer. And the next layer, after you've identified that emotion is, okay, why, like, when, like, what happened specifically to elicit this response? Like, what happened? What, 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 in what moment in the game, specifically, made you feel this way? So you're getting really jacked up. What happened? Was it that you died to a gank? Did you fail a roam? Did you get solo killed? What happened? But, okay. Okay. Then he says, okay, yeah, it was this this moment here. I'm like, okay, great. So now we've recognized the emotion. We've recognized what actually brought about that emotion. Let's go even deeper. Let's go to the next layer. Why? Why? What, what about this is frustrating to you? What about this was angering to you? Like what what made it so frustrating to you? And then, the, and then he said something like, yeah, because I know after I die here, I know that I'm just going to be really far behind. I'm like, okay, well, why? And then okay, let's go a little bit deeper. But why is that so frustrating? It's like, oh yeah, because it means that like my chances of like winning this game are like really, really low or whatever. Like I, I really want to win this game or whatever. I'm like, okay, well then why is winning this specific game so important to you? And so we just followed. I just kept going. I just kept going. I just go this layer and the next layer and the next layer. You, you kept, kept asking why. Yeah, just kept asking. I just kept going why, right? I just mm. kept going deeper. And I'm like, I'm visualizing this. I'm drawing it as we go along. Like this iceberg. Oh, cool. The layers, right? Yeah. And I'm like, we're getting to the root cause here in a moment. Mm. And I said, look. So what everyone's just watching this. Yeah, we're just watching. I'm just, I'm just doing this. And in everyone's session. In, the, in the Discord. This yeah, is the, Discord. It's just a normal session, right? It's a normal yeah. session. Yeah. Right? And I'm like. It all stemmed the, off from that level three gang. Yeah, thing, essentially. Yeah. And I said, well, well like, what? Well, where are we at now? And like, we get to the bottom and then I'm like, well, then why is this win so important to you? Like, why so angry that you have to win this game? And it got to the point where I'm like, you've just got a fixed mindset. You're actually, you're actually, and the, 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 what we got to at the end was he didn't fundamentally believe that he, that he could improve at the game. Love it. How fascinating is that? Mm. So it started with giving a shit VOD, which, which, which really rung alarm bells. And then I asked that question and go to the specific moment he got upset about like why he was getting so upset about it. You just keep going, why, 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 why? And the point was that he'd been kind of kind of going between zero and 200 off in Master Tier for like quite a long time. And he'd actually just didn't believe. He, he genuinely fixed mindset. He's like, I, I, I don't know how to improve. I don't believe I can improve. Like, and right now I'm just, that's why he's so frustrated because if he wins this game, it's like a relief. It's like, oh, I'm getting my LP. I'm, I've got some sort of like, I'm not, at least I'm, I'm, I'm working. I'm getting, I'm potentially climbing past my point. <laughs> yeah. And then when he loses, it, it's like, it's like, it's like he's, cause he's not actually getting any learning from it. Yeah. The progress there's no upwards, is, there's no, there's no progress. Way. Yeah. So think about how frustrating that would be. Imagine if you had a game, you die, you know, you're probably going to lose the game and you're not going to learn anything from anyway. You fucking lose your mind. Mm-hmm. Right. And the only way we came to this was doing that process. And now look, I said, I shouldn't have to do this for you. I'm, I'm here to point you in the right direction, but I'm like, this is what stage four issues are. And this is how you find them out. This is what you need to do. This is the work. This is the, 
the introspective, the tough conversation you've got to have with yourself. And and for a lot of, and for, you know, I remember like how I felt in the vault. I'm like, wow, people don't actually even know how to do this. Like it's not actually common knowledge of just keep just asking why and why and why and why. And I wanted to show people how to do it. Mm, the and introspection. This is what you, and this is what you guys got to do. If you're that bothered, you're feeling you're getting that jacked up about your games, go through that exercise. Yeah. Yeah. The why, the why, and view it, view it. It's like an iceberg. Keep going. It's like this huge thing under the surface. It just looked like one little thing at the top, didn't it? Oh yeah, I got a little, I got pissed off because I died to a gank. And a lot of people write that off. I was actually tempted when I remember did the review. We looked at the match specifics, looked at the gank, whatever. I was going to just end up review it. Yeah, and that guy was, would have been plodding along. <laughs> yeah, do it, for keep the going next, again. Keep yeah. going again and again. Then nothing yeah, would have been yeah. resolved. So you've got to, if again, go back. So if you're having a severe emotion, again, anger, frustration is going to be the most one yeah. for league. You need to really be asking why am I having this emotion? Especially if it's it's causing like, if you feel like it's causing really, yeah, severe emotion, self-sabotaging behavior. And you can't just be like, okay, why? It's like, why? Well, Nathan Curtis, I just don't want to lose LP. Like yeah. why? But we got to go yes, further There's down. more than that. Yeah. And now sometimes, I mean, look, for some people, it can just be like, I've, you know, I'm just genuinely frustrated because I've, you know, I, I wanted to get some rank by X amount of time. But then that, even then it's like, well, why is that so important? You know, it's like, oh, I have some, to I have some unrealistic expectation or whatever it might yeah, be. You know, yeah. this is usually, if you're getting that upset, there usually is some, something that you need to resolve nine times out of 10, you know? So this is why League's so cool, Curtis, because it teaches you, it's, it's, the game is so hard, so difficult. The rank system is so precise that the feedback, you're instantly getting the feedback instantly but also over a long time as well mm. you're seeing it so it forces you to you have to introspect you have to you have you to respect have to. you have to review and that's uh, that, that's what sports all that because it's because you don't have really have that in life that much like put in effort outcome instantly mm. like instantaneously okay well i lose this game i lose mm. this skirmish right mm. you like break down okay why am mm. i losing this skirmish that sort of stuff that's what I, that's what's so important about competition mm. and sports and stuff that you don't really have in life mm. Because, you know, let's say if you start having like, you know, bad habits and stuff, you know, maybe you don't see the consequence of that for years, mm. right? 100%. And this is where I had this discussion on that, my interview with Central where it ties into a broader discussion about, I, I, feel, I, re I truly believe to this day, there's only two ways to get somewhat success in league. You got to be completely blissful ignorance and not give a fuck and just completely like don't think don't think just deeply you are just having so much fun in the game complete have like like <laughs> like you know the bow special type thing in a way well he's kind of he's not he's the greatest example of that yeah he's still introspective he's still introspective but like let's say you know we probably know all know people who are just like really happy go lucky you know relax not overthinking shit have have a bit of fun they just play 15 games a day play 15 games a day not overthinking it don't get too tilted whatever and they just play, 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 don't think. And, you know, because they're actually act they're actually able to express them themselves because they have no mental baggage, they're actually able to make a decent amount of progress and just trust their intuition naturally because they don't know anything else, right? So there's like very, very shallow thinking. Or you think very deeply and understand why things actually happen the way they do. Um, and which leads to you being able to like, create consistency in your gameplay, et cetera, et cetera. But getting to that point is the hardest bit. Yeah. Because it's all the demons that come out along the way and trying to and manage the, But the hard part as well is that when you're, th you can go for the overthinking route as well. Yeah, that and as then well. you can create such sophisticated narratives yeah. that it takes ages to unbreak them. Like I always say that sometimes the, I feel like you can just using this example again, like you, the smarter you are, sometimes the harder it is to improve at yeah. league. I found as well, especially for some, some of my clients. But, but, you know, but you know why that is? And even Central came out the other side of this was because you need to, to, to very switched on intelligent deep thinkers they understand they they actually do understand the difficulty of the game they understand how hard the game really is and they understand the amount of like permutations that the amount of things that can happen or and how one little mistake can change the entire outcome of the game like they think in that game like Oh, if I didn't make the mistake, oh my god! Like this game would have been so easy, and yeah. like they're now thinking, now why did I do that? that? Yeah, I've done, and I, they can recount <laughs> specifically how many games I've done that. The last, like, the date that they did that, like what other people are thinking. Like they will go to the ends of the earth mentally, 
you know, to think about that. But but the reality is that Nathan, the other the, what you need to do is you need to have le- like deep thought, but then you a respect submit- for the intuition for the game, mm. muscle memory. Mm. That's what sensual struggle with. You thought you can think deeply, but if you don't have a respect for the muscle memory feel of yeah. the game, that's the don't think, right? So you, yeah. you simultaneously have to think, but don't think. That's right. That's right. That's what that's the that's what you need to get to. Yep. But some people just are only thinking. That's what that's what you're saying. When yep. they don't or only specs. feeling. Yeah. What you got to do both. Mm. League is a game of both. You got to have insane amount of feel and intuition, and you got to be, a, you know, a sophisticated thinker and think deeply and understand the consequence of your actions and think in other people's perspectives and think about the chain zero series of events about things and think about wing conditions. This stuff it takes a lot of, you know, what do they call it? Like, um, oh, what's the what's the term where it's like. You're thinking it, it, one iteration, and then there's the sec- second. There's like a, a word for it. I can't, I can't help you, here, Curtis. I can't remember. Anyway, it's like second order or third order. Oh, you know yeah. what I mean? First order, second order, third order. It's like order you, you, you know, it's like if this happens, then that happens. But if I do that, then that. It's like you know what I mean? It's like you're thinking two steps in advance, three steps in advance, four steps in advance. You know. Moving on. All right, we'll move on to our Reddit post. This one is not from Summoner School today, Curtis. This one's from okay. Reddit League of Legends. Uh, this post, uh, this was this week. It has five, 600 upvotes and about 600 comments. Okay. There's only one part of this that I really want to go over. Um, if you want to read the post, I'll have it linked. But uh, essentially the title here is a challenger's perspective on League in general, as well as addressing people's common concerns with the game. And there's a couple of dot points here. And he has this, you know some lots of little dot points and overall arching titles so the first one is the game is not bad second one the game's really balanced up harassing us developers the th- uh, s- the next one is elo hell loses queue does not exist the next one is in any competitive setting there will be unavoidable negative emotion toxicity the interesting one i want us to the last point here curtis mm. this got a lot of discussion by discord as well i think we've talked about this on the podcast maybe before anyone could hit challenger but you must be playing to win rather than simply playing for enjoyment and I'll read the post here. And then he says, but it takes people years to hit Challenger. Yeah, but this is the difference between playing with intent and playing for fun. You'll never hit it as a casual unless you're able to play 10 games a day for an eternity. People play for seven years and remain gold and others can hit Challenger in two. Time does not necessarily equate to skill, but over time, intentional playing will directly correlate to skill. In addition, in physical sports, coaching is extremely normalized, if not just flat out necessary. In esports, it is not as common for individual players or looked down upon, in my opinion. Simply put, there is no way a casual player will ever outclass a player who is obsessed with the game, no matter what rank they may be. A more talented player may beat a less talented player initially, but if the other player has an obsession for perfection, he will eventually become inferior. Obsession can become talent itself. A player who thinks about the game more will not only have more reputations in matches, but will also create a habit of processing situations in the game, and that means more thoughtful repetitions. Enough thoughtful repetition will lead to near perfection. TLDR, if you want to hit Challenger, stop playing as a casual and play a lot of games with a lot of intent. Even if you have barely any talent, obsession can amount for a lack of initial skill. So Curtis, when I first read mm. this, I think of like how I would be talking like back like when I was 19, 20 yeah. years old. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like a very, I don't want to say... Image, surface level. Surface level. It's a very sort of like a cool idea. It's like anyone mm. can challenge. If you just be obsessed, you know, like a little motivational dream. Yeah. It's like, at the end of the day, if you just look at just really logical, just raw statistics, it's it's not. No. It's literally not possible for anyone to hit challenge up. No. People are, again, realizing the percent, the percentile. Um of how hard it is to get to Challenger. Getting Challenger is incredibly difficult. Incredibly, incredibly difficult. And it doesn't matter how obsessed you are. There are people that, uh, you know, I mean, obsession is helpful. There's no, I'm not going to deny that obsession is helpful, but, you know, I don't think it's an overly helpful thing to say that anyone can get Challenger. Yeah. We talk a lot about the importance as well of like coming to league of like, having that time the years already prior either playing other computer games or just like yeah being on the like playing pc games mm. that background is so important well you know, i want to make it very clear actually just one thing here I, before we get into that topic mm. you know i've got people in my program that are absolutely obsessed mm. like we're talking dedicate their life like their life revolves around the game 
and they're still they ask a lot of questions. They ask questions. They, they come to exactly reviews all they the time. All they the... thought, think about the game. They follow the process. They do everything, and they're still just low master, and be master for a long time. You know, I'm not saying they will never get challenger, but like, like, yeah. I think it's so disrespectful to the to to the amount of people that are obsessed. There are so many people that are obsessed <laughs> about right, the game. Yeah, yeah. There are people that are obsessed about the game and play with intent or are in or been in like diamond for years as or master low master for years, you know. So the reality is that like I think that, you know, having obsession is only is something that will help you a lot. And I think it's kind of like a a borderline bare minimum. Like you have to be really dedicated and passionate about the game. I agree. That's kind of like barrier to entry. But there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people that are dedicated and passionate about the game and really care about the game and and center league around their life. Like that's, that's shit ton. If you're a challenger player on a major region, you're borderline a semi-professional at the game. Yes. <laughs> right? Mm. So, yeah, sorry, go on about the background of gaming. Yeah, background, like a lot of things need to sort of be clicking in a way, you know, like a lot of the sort of the time that you play the game. You know, at the end of the day, if you, let's just flat out say it. If someone is like 22 years old, right? They've never played a PC game before. They've only played console and they're rocking up their start in the game now. I would say it's it's impossible for them to get Challenger. I don't think I would not say... Not impossible, maybe. I wouldn't say... Impossible. I don't like the word impossible. Very... It's just like very hard. Extremely difficult. Very, just very difficult, yeah. Because by the time they get... Yeah, I mean, the game will be evolving so fast as well. The game will be evolving fast, yeah. but and also, you know, as you get older as well, like... You have less time. Less time. Like, the time aspect is very... People don't realize that people... Like, it, it's really cool to say in isolation where people yeah. just sit there for... Defication. But you can't. Like, people have... You gotta work. You have, and, you have, like, you have a relationship. <laughs> yeah, you, you have a relationship. Career. You gotta work. I, I, I will career. say this confidently. Yeah. I do believe anyone can get master. Do you think so? I do. I do believe that. Uh, mine is. I do. Mine this. is Diamond Four. I'm not convinced really? that I'm master yet. No. Really? Yeah. The, the, just because I've just seen. Yeah. I've seen some absolute characters get master here. <laughs> really? <laughs> you know, like. No, but what's their backgrounds like? Curtis? Like, come on, let's really. Do you? Are you sure? Look, the the look. I think that anyone who is genuinely, genuinely passionate about the game, like, I because okay, I think that the. I think that master tier. Okay, so let's, let's get specific. Okay, what makes a challenger? Let's let's just have a quick discussion about what what we think makes a challenger player. Okay, mm. a challenger player. You know the main. Okay, let's actually make it even clearer. Let's make the question clearer. What is the differences in your mind? And let's just speak from a jungle and mid perspective. What makes? What's the clear differences between a bottom of master jungler and a challenger jungler oh it's so hard i mean spit, okay, it doesn't spit, you know, spitball oh spitball all right uh what are things that what comes to mind speed in decision making okay ability to process information extremely fast uh yeah i mean obviously micro micro is absolutely one just they're just better at the champion like really good at the champion like really got a lock Mm, these are the first things that are coming to my mind. There's so many others. That's basically it. They're the main ones. That's yeah. the first ones. Okay. The process information one is extremely important and the speed and the size and confidence in plays. But I don't know if that's a result. But how are you not saying was. anything to do with win conditions? I, I feel like junglers mean. that are like high level do like, like low master junglers, I feel like have no... Little to no understanding. Mm, that's like, from your perspective. From my perspective, yeah. I'm like they, I feel like they li- so a lot of them are like absolutely clueless about what they need to do in a game. Like, like the, the, uh, that's at least from my perspective, from Elena's perspective. Anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that. I'm just trying to think about some of my my my, my members. Yeah, that think have about your really clients. understand win conditions. Like, like that's not really gonna get them that. I feel like it's actually right. Uh, okay, but is that just your program? So wait, you know wait, I mean? wait, is that is that win conditions? Are you talking about win conditions from the level one or like adapting to a win condition in the like game? adapting in the game? Like the they, game, they might yeah. have a plan at the start. Yeah. It's like oh, yeah. I see this matchup. Yeah, they everyone can, can have the plan. Everyone at the has start. the initial yeah. plan. They yeah. they know where to path. Yeah, but when shit hits the fan and when like the game is panning out, like they don't know how to like yeah, you're read right. the game yeah. state yeah. Yeah, no, at right. all. Yeah, yeah, like zero idea in mid game. Yeah. Like I feel like sometimes. Okay, that's how at least again how I feel. Yeah, as a low, I'm talking low master jungle. Yeah, I would say that even yeah. My master tier players and stuff. We need to work on that quite a bit. Yeah. That's huge. Because I feel like that's for mid. I was going to say the same thing. Like for mm. mid, like, 
like I have a really pretty clear framework, like all the way from we get gold up, right? Yep. Like platinum, right? Is about is about you and and your um your matchup, like the one v one. Emerald is about the two v two, right? Diamond is about the comps five v fives. Mm. Master mm. is now going to like the extreme about the game, like. 5v5 on steroids. So it's like, okay, you need to know how that top matchup like pretty clearly plays out and like how snowball it is. And you know, what, what, what does that kill mean? If you were to roam there, like, what does that mean? How, like you need to do it in a, in a very sophisticated way. What does like a kill mean for me in this game? Like if I get a kill here, does this mean I can carry? Or does this mean I st that kill doesn't actually mean that much and I still need to get someone else ahead and I still need to play for someone else? Like that on steroids in every comp in every game. That makes, that's what makes, in my opinion, a challenge play. They know how to win a game of League of Legends. They know how to kill the Nexus. And the yeah. only way to get to that point is to you need to look at the game to an in-depth level from everyone else's perspective. Like, I know if my bot lane in a specific game gets a kill, like, I know very clearly, like, what that means for the game. Well, yeah. Or, like, if I get a kill, if I'm playing Oriana and, like, based off their comp, how effective is this one kill? Sometimes a kill won't mean jack shit. Yeah. But in other games, I've won the game. Like, one kill, I win the game. Mm. Like, straight up, I know I can win the game from mm. one kill, mm. from, like, eight minutes in the game. And that only comes from a shit ton of experience and incredibly in-depth thought and real in-depth curiosity across the board. To get to blow master, I feel like you can do it many ways, but like you don't need to have a super sophisticated understanding yeah, no, of like right, the game holistic. Right. Like yeah. you can be, be very good at your champ, you can know your mid jungle two v two, you can have pretty clear reference points, and then that's really it. Like I've seen players in my program that if you they like they they have a lot of champ mastery, like they they're not super sophisticated mechanically, but they you know they're pretty competent. They can like land majority of their abilities. And they have like just clear reference points. Like, and, and it obviously depends on the champ. Let's say they play Swain. It's like, all right, I get to this item. There's a dragon. You know, roughly, can we fight this or not? You know, if you're just playing basic intent, you know, and you know the the, the frameworks of how, you know, okay, how does my my champ really basically work in this situation? Like, you you can get with a lot of those simpler champions, you can get to master tier. Now that's very different maybe if you're playing Yasuo or something, but like there's a lot of champs in mid lane, a lot of champs in mid lane that you can have pretty clear reference points and get to master. Like Malzahar, Annie. I mean, Zerath. not even. I'm even talking to other champs. Like even like a champ Victor. like Syndra as well. Syndra. Like like there are a lot of champs that it's like, all right, I get to my 40 stacks on Syndra. I get to my Lost Chapter. I get to my Ludens. And like, okay, I want the enemy to come to me. I want to make sure I'm not getting flanked. I want to play around neutral objectives. Like a lot of mages have this very clean, even like there's other assassins as well. Like, even Kiana, Kiana surprisingly has very clear reference points. Mm. It's like, all right, I get, uh, especially if you go on the tier Muramana build, it's like, all right, I get to, I get to my, um, my dust blade or whatever it is. And I get to my Muramana and then I get I play off my R cooldown, my level 11. I got to play around neutral objectives. If I don't have R, I don't make the play. It's like, you can be very rigid and you can follow those rules in a pretty rigid way. And you can get a lot of success in solo queue. If you're, if you know, if you have the champ mastery and you know your limits, and I don't think that's foreign. I don't think that's un un unfeasible for the average player, person. And that's upon my experience. Um, and I've seen people at the moment like getting high diamond that barely, you know, they're really. Not, I wouldn't say the most sophisticated gamers. And just because they're you playing, mean the, their gaming background is not that. They're yeah, just, this is they, like their first competitive game. And they're just, you know, they're just. But they they have champ mastery, mm. and the champ mastery gets mm. them nowadays to a lot of some high diamond. You know, mm. that's at least what I see. And now this, this is where maybe jungle and, and mid are different. Maybe to bridge that gap between D4 and master, as a jungler, you do need to go to that kind of like level. I don't, I don't know. I can't count, comment on that, but I'm just speaking from my experience. Mm. Timbers, I actually haven't thought about it that much, dude, honestly. Like, right. It's sort of a question of anyone can hit challenger. Like I just look at John Wooden over there and I'm like, would he engage in the conversation? Can anyone be an NBA player? Right. You know, like how right. would he, how would he approach that question? Yeah, I don't know. I it's feel like question. he wouldn't, but like he would just be like, how would he respond, Gertis? I don't think he would care that much. It's just about putting yeah. you're doing your best every day. Whether you know, they could or couldn't, it doesn't affect. Yes, him. it doesn't affect. That's right. You right. just the process. Because doing no, your best. What he was obsessed about was about everyone. He he just wants every. He wanted every person on his team to express their best self. Yes, that was his mission. Yeah. I know he says it in a different way. Um. 
yeah, do, do, doing you, you, the self-satisfaction and knowing you did your best to become the best that you are capable of becoming. And that level is different for everyone. So that, because like people will say success is challenger, but his definition of success is not being in the NBA. Wherever, yeah, and that and, and success for, for everyone is different depending on what their capabilities are. Mm, exactly right. right, yes. And your capabilities at max, given your situation, might be diamond. Yeah, it Could might be, be emerald. Even, yeah, emerald, yeah. That could be it given the amount of time you're able to put into the game, right? That, that is part of your capabilities, right? Mm. Cause it's not like everyone has the ability to sit there and do, you know, two, three blocks every day, five days a week. I mean, that's just completely unreasonable, but um, yeah, maybe I'm fucking delusional though. I don't know. I don't yeah. Know. I think it's just not really a conversation to be honest. Yeah. That so hard. So, so th it is a bit theoretical. It's right really theoretical. Like theoretical. I could see people and then it's, losing it's, their minds around. And it gets people off the wrong track. Yeah, off, off the, the wrong track. track. It's, it's, a, it's, it's a bad thing. It's focused on the wrong thing. It's, 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 it? it's a fucking bad thing. I think we lost our minds there as well. We did. I think we got baited. We got baited. We got baited in. I will say though, just about just on this thing, Nathan, on this topic, um, like, I, I do look, I, I like the idea. I like the message though of like, you know, being clear. Do you want to, do you want to be a cat? Do you want to play the game casually or do you want to, you know, actually play with curiosity and 10 and problem solve? Like, like that's what I, that's the, that's how I interpret that whole thing, you know, mm. from his, mm. from his Reddit post. And I think that's an important question. We yeah. all should ask ourselves and wherever that gets us. It doesn't really matter. It's the, it's the effort and the, the satisfaction in going through that journey. All right. You want to do any comments that you wanted to look for on that one? Um, no, I think we're not going to bait any further, Curtis. Okay. Let's move on. So Curtis's clips? Yep. Let's do it. Let's get into the details, guys. And welcome, everyone, to Curtis's Clip Corner. All right. So Nathan has not seen this clip. Now, this is going to be a bit of a different Curtis's Clip Corner, okay? I'm going to show you this. Now I want you to, I want you to review this as if you were the, the say this kindred in this situation was maybe your 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 coaching client, okay? I want you to really break this one down, and I want to get your take on this, and then we're going to look at it from the mid and jungle perspective, all right? Okay. So let's play this one out. So for the people listening, looks like the kindred here finishes top scuttle and is looking for a bit of a cross map through mid here. We got a Talia mid. And look, to be honest, if you're not listening, you, you, if you're not watching this, you just got to watch. <laughs> yeah, I can't explain it's too many variables. Too yeah. variables. So you see Kindred cross mapping. It's four minutes in the game. So he's going for a double crab. I want to, okay, the jungle's popped up. Yep. Was he done a record? Yeah, he's got it. He's got it. It looks like a tier two boots, right? Because he's got the, um, let's go back here. They said, yeah, Hecarim has tier ah, two boots. Ah, interesting. Right? Okay, yep. So let's go back here a little bit again. Sorry. So how do you review? How would how would you review this, Nathan? This situation. Wow, very interesting. Okay, so let's look at some variables here. Yeah. So it's so interesting. So there's a Nasus and a Nasus Talia mid. mid. Um, you know, a lot of people say Nasus mid's quite useless, but I also view Talia as quite a really weak early game champion. One of the well. worst in the game. It's one of the worst it's in the so game. So weak. Right? It's super Piss shit weak. <laughs> in skirmish, especially Rivers. Early skirmishes. game. The champ. I just want to give you like it, like you're not a champion yeah. until Lost Chapter Level yeah. Seven straight yeah. up. So who we whose perspective are we in this from? From Kindred's perspective. I want you to look, yeah. If if that Kindred brought this into a clip, so posted this in the Nathan's clip channel and said, well, "What do I take away from this?" So watch it again. Well, I need more context on the early game. Okay, so what? Yeah, watch the Let's, early game. I gotta watch the early game. Okay, watch now. just All skim right. through the early path thing. Because like, how did we get? Because he di he dies to the heck room. Is okay, that's another problem? Okay, so he goes red into into his blue grump. Is that the classic? The kindred goes starts his red buff, and then the, the typical blue grump. Okay, so did and oh dude, this is not even good for him. Yeah, this is not good. Yeah. So what happens is he goes to the blue because the only way this works is if Hecarim starts. Because it looks like Hecarim did the wolves, I think. Let me, let me see. Let me see. Yeah, he did the wolves start. Yeah, yeah, that's a new path, by the way. So uh, what they do is they do wolves, raptors, regular. It's like an it's a good anti invade path as well. Uh, yeah, so that's so smart. It's that's already in a review for Kindred. It already is in a review. Okay, so okay, well let's just like, continue let's, on. Let's keep because at obviously this, this, this yeah. affects the mid laner. Mid -laner. Here, right? Okay, so again we got to review from the mid laner. Like, look at this Kindred. Now he's skipping all these candles. Yeah, no, what happened? No, but, but the, the Talia messed up here though. Because Talia, this was the, the second, there was two clips that I yeah. got sent. This is the first one. I said this was Talia's fault. Talia should be collapsing here. 
Yeah, oh, absolutely. But she doesn't. Oh no. Yeah. So then, then, then Kindred. Um, Is that from Kill Kindred? Yeah, yeah I think so. So the general principle, guys, is as a, <laughs> if, you, if you're invading, you've got to get level three first. So he's just got to commit to the Gromp there. You got to do Gromp. It's like and your blue you gets taken. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's fine. It's fine though, right? Yeah. At that point, I mean, it's yeah. still bad, but yeah. like it's not that bad. This is why I hate level two invades. I'm anti level two invades in Soul 2. Okay. It's so flip. Just unless, flip. Unless you're playing Graves or Kindred and they start blue buff and you catch him on the Gromp. That's okay. the only high percentage for it. So like. now you're you're screwed, right? I know it's already end of review for her, but the reality is that. So what, what does Talia do now? Okay, so then now Kindred goes. Wow, so he's still top here. He's level four now to level three. Okay. Yeah. All right, we'll get back in the game. So that's why Kekram is able to be based, right? And yeah, has tier two so boots. Yeah, has tier two boots. Now, so then sense. he gets the, he gets the mark right, on so then top now side. The question you ask is, okay, he gets marked on top Yeah. Okay, so where is Hecarim going to go and go to go out of base? And he's going to go straight 100% back bot side. Yeah. Rules so he's got back bot side of base. Yeah. The question you ask is, Kindred, okay, I'm level three with 30% health right now. Yeah. Um, so does I know, this, does I know Hecarim's bot side. So, yeah, it's really simple. Like, you just can't go bot side here, dude. So, the only thing you'll possibly be doing and you can't here, go bot side because Hecarim would have based and, like, would yeah, have been able to spend his and items. And he's also level four. And he's level up on And his bot side. Yeah, you cannot go for the bot crab in a million years. So, um, and he would have some gold users. So, what you'll do is you'd probably want to defend your raptors away from Hecarim. So, what I'll actually be doing is Kindred. I'll be going down to my raptors here. Mm. I'll skip my Grom to raptors, Krugs, then reset and maybe deploy hold smarts you can deploy straight back All right, whatever or there's something. something about that right so anyway yeah. this kindred then goes onto bot side yeah and then and then like this happens and this is the sorts of clips i get all the time yeah interesting. these sorts of clips yeah. from like the, the situations are show shit and so this ties into a discussion which like he, he doesn't want this yeah, right like Talia doesn't want this he doesn't want the, he, he's, he's like pinging for assistance like mm. the kindred's like pinging for assistance oh. and this is where a lot of my mid learners in my academy get, have these situations where it's like yeah it's the reality is that you've got to ping it off but it's so hard for the average player especially yeah, if you're in platinum play, yeah, or something yeah. to like ping this off you just you know? gotta like, like I say in my stream let them rot you just let kindred rot you right. just do whatever whatever yeah. what does Talia want to do here yeah that's push the wave and base you just yeah, have you to just want to just rot. chill for it yeah yeah shove you the wave and base that's die. right I don't give an F about this that's, uh, exactly that's the same is conclusion I came okay, to and, it, and so this is where this ties into a broader discussion about how and it's really good by the way to hear your perspective it makes so much sense because I was like I didn't really understand this from a jungler's perspective yeah. um, so Again, I'm referring to it a lot, but my interview with Central was really interesting because he said one of his big breakthroughs was that he had to be unapologetic about the yes. decisions that he's making in the game. Yes. You have to have that selfish kind of fuck all of you mindset. I'm going to make a decision. I'm going to do what's good for me. Unless it's high percentage, I don't give an Yes, F. exactly. Yes. Unless it's high percentage, I don't give a shit because, yeah. because the reality is that we have to... This is the hardest thing about League. You got to be okay with losing the game off this play, mm. but you got to know that if this is a high percentage play, yes, okay, this might work seventy percent, seventy percent of the time. I mean, let's say me basing, sorry, is seventy percent of the time leaving this Talia, leaving this Kindred to die is the best play seventy percent of the time, game, right? Yes, that means three out of seven times you're going to lose the game because, like, let's say, just because your Kindred dies, your jungle tilts, whatever, mm. right? Mm. The reality is that you're playing the you're playing the odds game. That's why leagues like poker. You actually have to view league like an odds game. So if you have these clear reference points and things that your champion wants to do, you have to have faith that if I stick to these kind of like for the most part in most situations, like stick to my reference points and I take the high percentage play majority of the time, I'm going to climb in the long run. And you can't get distracted. And even though you may lose the game off this play, like maybe your jungler tilts, whatever, you have to actually be at yeah. peace with that and Correct. be okay with that. Yes. And that's so hard. That's, the, that's one of the hardest things about League. And, and I think this is a really good reminder. And it's what I said. It's like, you got to just ping this off. You've got to be unapologetic. Yeah. You've got to screw other people over. And you've got to be selfish. And if we play this situation, you know, a hundred times, a pre-first base, first strike Talia without lost chapter is just a piece of shit. You're not going to be able to win a yeah. 2v2. As well, combined with a level three Kindred against a full level four based bought right. Hecarim. But let's say, let's just like ignore that for a second. Let's yeah. say the Hecarim and the Kindred are actually equal level. Mm. Let's say they're both level four and mm. the Hecarim has not based. Yep. I still... I still I still as well. Still just fuck let it. Let them rot. Let them rot. Yeah, leave them. Doesn't yep. matter. Yep. <laughs> In your words, let them rot. Like, yep. like, I think honestly, it's way better for the... Especially if you're unsure... Like, cause this is the two, this is the two kind of trains of thought, Nathan. Uh, hmm. I'm unsure. Maybe I can make this work. I'm going to go there and limit test. Yes. Okay. You can do that. You'll get learnings. 
and I think that's good to do every now and then. But I think that, like, in the long run, like, you really... It's like you have to do both. You actually have to do both. You have to, like, do these limit tests and fuck around and find out. But then you also, once you've done a lot of fucking around, be like, okay, I've, I've fucked around enough. I've, I, yeah. I know my limits now. I know that I am really a piece of shit pre-level seven, yeah. pre-level chapter. I just want to get to my level seven, yeah. lost chapter and see what I can do. It's like the, you're like, I can fight early. I definitely can. Yeah. But, like, it's going to be really good. It's got to be really good. <laughs> it's got, exactly. It's got to be really good. Yeah. Um, it's got to be high percentage. And again, notice how this is just, it's just, it's just, you know, very messy. League's just a messy game. Mm. It's just a fucking messy game, Nathan. It's messy. It's a messy game. (laughs) And this is why I love that, you know, you talk, you use the plane crash analogy. You know, this is like, it's a mess, dude. It's a mess. This is ugly. This is, this this, this game's getting ugly. ugly. If you let Kendra die, the game gets ugly. Yep. And, and that's it. So, so, so real TLDR, this one quickly, guys. You're going to have to do some limit testing. You're going to have to do that, the whole fuck around and find out. But then you're also going to have to be very strict to the T, stick to your reference points and feel what that's like. And you're just flip-flopping between the two. Hmm. Very interesting. Moving right. on. Mailbag time. Away we go. Alrighty then, our first question here comes from Shorty Prince. The title of this email is Playing Better in Long Sessions and Three Block Distribution. Hi Curtis and Nathan, I'm a long time BBC listener and I'm an ADC player. I really enjoy your content about motivation and the thoughts you guys have about the game, despite the role disconnect. Recently, I just hit Masters in North America, and I've noticed something interesting in my sessions. I tried to do one three block a day because I believe in them for the same reasons you guys do, but I've noticed that I normally do not play very well in these sessions. Most of the time, I play after classes at around 5 to 6 p.m., and by that time, I'm pretty exhausted from the day. Because ADC is a role that depends so much on reaction time and insanely fast decision making, I think the quality of my games is just very low because of mental fatigue. I think my best sessions are on the weekends when I can sleep in and I don't have to worry about class. My first question is, do you think playing 18 games over the weekend, three three blocks a day over the course of Saturday and Sunday, is as valuable as playing 18 games over the course of the week, one three block a day with one day off? Could the five-day break between sessions actually be beneficial in resetting mental? I listened to the most recent podcast about the science of taking breaks. So this is something that I am thinking about. Another thing I've noticed is that when I have very long sessions, no three blocks, I start playing better four to five games than in the beginning. I believe this is for two reasons. Number one, because ADC is so mechanically intensive, it takes me a couple of games to actually warm up. After my first three games, I just start to feel good. After a certain amount of games, I just become detached from the outcome. If I'm playing a three block, I can constantly have this voice in my head that says, what if I lose all three games? What if I just waste three hours of my life with low quality games that I don't even get a chance to perform in? When I'm queuing in long sessions, I get to the point where I'm just solely focused on my own performance because after so many games, winning or losing doesn't matter. After 1,000 games, I'll always be at the rank I deserve. So if I just grind a fuck ton of games, I don't feel as bad about the individual losses. I feel like with a three block, I'm actually more attached to the outcome of the session compared to if I just grind seven to eight games in a row. So that's his first question. Well, I I think he's actually completely wrong in terms of his hypothesis as to why he's not playing well. I think it has absolutely nothing to do with energy levels. I think if you're if you're a young kid, you're going to school, you know, just eat a sandwich and play, man. Like you know, you're fine. Like you, yeah. <laughs> like trust me, you should be wired. Yeah. You know, you shouldn't ready be having. To go. You should be wired and ready to go. You know, so I don't think you're. Um, I mean, you did this back in your university days. You'd play. Oh, yeah. you, would, you would be study. Uh, yeah, go to uni all day. We'll play pro matches. Yeah, play pro matches and play out of my mind. You know, it doesn't matter. You know, at that age, especially if you're obsessed and you get you, you're enjoying it. I, I just think what you've got is more fatigue from. It seems like he's he's making a massive deal out of the three blocks. That's really what it mm. is. It's going to feel more fatiguing because you're you're so you're jacking yourself up in terms of thinking about the results. You're, you're making a big deal about it. Because like, that's why it's stressful emotionally, probably as well. And I think you know, 
I think other people have written in with the same thing where they feel like, oh my God, I can only play three games. So I don't want to end on a loss. I want to make sure that I, I get LP from this, like net LP to, from, yeah, this, from this session. From this Always, session. I want to have the chance to have that to happen as well. It's the, right. Give, let's say the weekends for him. It's like, okay, well, I have a chance to just yeah. go, get a shit load of LP. Exactly. Or play it's well, like, oh, it doesn't yeah. matter if I go zero three because I can then win the next six or whatever the hell it is. Right. Or like, even if I lose that, I, I got, I got, I get the to next play day, nine so, games yeah. the next day anyway. So <laughs> yeah. what's the point, right? There's, so, there's, feel, there's overall feeling like more progression rather than the one zero three block or the three blocks at right. one three block a day. Right. And I think he needs to really, um, yeah, I guess fix his relationship with three blocks. I think he's really got the other way around. And I think that the whole 18 game over two days is a band aid solution to the core problem, which is you're not really utilizing three blocks properly, properly. Hmm. You know, the way you got to think of it is like, okay, I'm going to go in, I'm going to do a three block rain, hail or shine. I'm going to have a crack. I'm going to get some learning and then that's it. It's not about get net LP gain or loss. It's not about the, it's not about anything else. Whether you take one thing away from a game or three things away from a game, it's just that I play. That's what I do. That's my routine. It's like going to the gym. It's like, I go to the gym. If I'm tired, I go. If I, if I'm feeling great, I go, you go no matter what and you do what you can. That's it. Now, some days you're going to be killing it and you're going to feel like a beast. Yeah. Other games, you're not. That's I'm just, a big what fan of low-intensity blocks. Yeah, just do it. Yeah, Nathan talks about that all the time. This low-intensity, shitty blocks. Just do a shitty block. Mm. And be okay with a shitty block. Because it's not so much about the results of that block. Like, hey, it doesn't make logical sense. It's about not making a big event of it. Yeah. It's just rocking up for work. Here we go. Yeah, that's right. It's that, that long-term mindset that you're actually developing by rocking up. And then I think that it should be the other way around, if anything. I think the consistent blocks say one block every five days and then maybe you do a three block or let's say even a, a, a two get two a two session block um on a sad day you should take sunday off like if anything like i actually again i'm a massive advocate of breaks i think breaks are so important like i think if you're not taking at minimum at absolute minimum one day off a fortnight from league i think you're setting yourself up to fail straight up like and, and that's something I will I will stand by at all costs. Till you die, Curtis. That is one because yeah. I've seen it time and time and time again. Yeah. Not only with many 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 clients, myself as well. Yeah. And I'm I th I, I become delusional. I think oh, I was fine. I'm I'm feeling fine because you, you you're not though. You, but you don't know that you're not feeling okay until you actually take the break and you get perspective and you feel refreshed. So I think taking one day off at least a fortnight is super important, if not even once a week. Especially if you're playing six games on that on that sad day, and then getting the, so you're playing twenty one games a week. That's great. If you're playing twenty one games a week, that's amazing. Yeah. Do you have any advice, Nathan, for how he could go about actually fixing his relationship with three blocks? Or what do you th what do you suggest that he that he does? Not really. I think the first tool you need to adopt is like I'm going to embrace going zero three, dude. Like let's get exciting on zero three, and just again not feeling like any progression. You just got to you got to build up the habit. I think you just got to get. How, the, my advice would be do it for a month and see how it goes. Hmm. And I think the, the my advice would be remind yourself that your goal is to take to be zero point zero one percent better every game. If you can walk from that game, take one minuscule thing. It's like, oh yeah, here on this fight, I could have spaced. I could have. I should have spaced that that one ability better. If that's your only learning, great. Own that. I'm getting zero point zero 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 one percent better. Excellent. I've got some forward tra trajectory, and that's it. It sounds like he's developing this mechanically intensity thing. He says that he plays better. He needs more games. Hmm. Low dodge game. Let's have it. We get a warm up before the game going. Maybe you need to actually have a bit of a warm up before a low dodge game. Try that. That's another thing as well. Try that. If you feel like that, you're playing, you don't actually ramp up until game four, game five. Again, I think that could probably be some narrative, but how about we figure out about a, a warm up? It should never take more than one game to warm up anyway, at, mm. like at, at absolute minimum. Mm. Right, like, and you should have a routine. Whether it's yeah, aim booster or whether it's low dodge game, you need to have a routine, man. You got to have a schedule. To get get your head in the game and get your hands warmed up. So he says, my second question is: Do you think that some players might actually benefit from playing more than just three games at a time? Everything about three blocks makes perfect sense theoretically for me, but in practice, I find that I perform better the longer my sessions go on, almost like a flow state after a certain number of games. Well, look, I, I think. The process is different for everyone. I, I look, I, our three block process is based around like some biological stuff, like things that we've heard about how the brain can only focus for a set amount of time. That's what we based our our three block off of. I'm sure there are outliers and, you know, I'm not going to completely discount the possibility or disregard the possibility that you could be an outlier and maybe you are yeah. 
you know, you can focus. Oh, there's on many fr- examples of people challenged players. You could ask everyone. Like, they've definitely, most of the time, they've probably done sessions of five, six, seven, eight games in a row, of course. Right. And, I, I, and again, I, I don't want to sit here and be like, you should only play three games. That's not what we're here to say. It's just, it's just an option. If it works for you, it works for you. If it doesn't work for you, it doesn't work for you. No big deal. You need to find the process that works well for you. My short answer to that question is yes, it is beneficial. 100%. It can be it can be beneficial can. to play more than three depending games on in a your session. personality and your situation. Yes, and if you how energetic you're feeling, how well you're sleeping, what your diet's like, and many many things. If you feel if you're feeling great and you're feeling like you can play five games, then you should play five games. Yeah. But like, you know, just proceed with caution. That's all I'm going to say. Proceed with and caution. just reflect. Ref- yes, reflect. If you're going to do that whole thing, you're going to do the whole five games six block thing. You got to be really honest with yourself. Because that's where a few things really come into play. Addiction comes into play. I mean, yeah, a lot of copium comes into play, right? Where you think, oh, it's just one more game, just one more game. Oh, I don't want to end on a loss. Or I'm feeling fine, don't worry. And you realize you're just like spacing out. You don't even realize, but you just you just want to make up for the last game that you played. Like there's so many bad habits that can, can creep up on you. So you, as long as, like Nathan said, reflect, then you should be all right. It's all about everything with this podcast and our coach. It's about having intention and reflecting. That's what we're all about, yeah. My next question comes here from Sirachi. The title of this email is struggling on main, but doing unbelievably well on Smurf. Dear to Cursor Nathan, my name is Sirachi, a talent main in the Midland Academy, hitting my peak of master last split and ending on it. This season, however, I've been playing considerably worse and found myself stuck in diamond with a pretty low win rate, which is okay. We all have bad splits, so I told myself there's no need to worry about my shaky gameplay as long as I stick to the process and don't get complacent. One day, however, I realized that my Smurf account that was using solely for warm-ups was higher than my main with an insane 63% win rate. At first, I just thought it was funny and laughed it off and kept using that account for warm-ups. I proceeded to continue not caring about the game on that account, reading my stream chat in between miniature lol states and sometimes even first time in champions like Akali, Azir, and Yone Top for just shits and giggles. I even checked League of Graphs and found out that if um, that I FF over 40% of the time on that account, probably because I'm thinking, oh, I'm just here to warm up so it doesn't matter. Before I knew it, I hit Master while my main was stuck in mid-diamond. I'm honestly not sure what to make of this, so I wanted to hear you guys' opinions. Obviously, this is some sort of mental issue, and despite myself saying that I should follow the process and that LP doesn't matter for improvement, there is definitely something going on in my subconscious that is making my play worse. Perhaps I try too hard on my main because deep down I'm thinking about the wins and the losses, and it's affecting my gameplay. Somehow, me not caring about my Smurf account to the point where I'm first time in champs and throwing up FF votes just because I'm bored is a better extreme than me try hiding my main. What do you guys think? I mean, this is simple. This is what I did last year, dude. Well, I think there's a few expectations. Things. There's no expectations. Expectations. Okay. So you got the OPGG. What is? What are we seeing here? Well, Curtis? let's look at the OPGG first, right. and then I think we can go from there, right? So the first thing that really jumps out to me is the amount of games played. So this is the this Smurf is the Smurf, account. right? Okay. Look at the amount of games played here, Nathan. Yep. So we've got for the listeners, we've got about seventy games played. With not many games, games, right? So you got to remember games. that. You know, this might not be the greatest represent representation of the rank because not a big the MMR size. and the, the, yeah, the, the the sample size, right? So you know, I don't know if that changes much, but I think it's just worth noting, right? Um, so what were your experiences, Nathan? Because you're the one that actually did this. You played on a second account. Your second account became higher than your main account. Yeah, that's what. What I did, did you last find? Year. I don't do. That. I only do one account this year, but last year I did two yeah. accounts. Um, yeah, I found that it was just the the removal of expectations and just having fun and playing free flow. And so to be clear, did you you were significantly higher on your second account than your main, right? Uh, so I finished, yeah, Challenger, 900 LP uh, on my main last year. And then my second account, yeah, my, 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 sorry, my Smurf account was 900 LP yeah. and my main account was 500 LP. So a 400 LP difference. Interesting. Which is about the same D4 to Master. But you it? were doing, were you doing a block on your main and then how many games were you playing on, your se- on that second account? How'd that work? Well, the process that I was doing was... Well, I switched it throughout the day. So initially I was doing three games at the afternoon and then three games at night. And that was my low intensity games. So the low intensity games were meant to be on your... My night games. Your second account. Yes. And that still happened to be higher, higher. right? That's right. Right. And so so your reflection, your your whole learning from that experience was just due to lowered expectations. That's right. You were able to express yourself better, yeah. not get too bogged down in... in just playing, negative, just, just playing, playing to play, yeah. I was playing just... Yeah. 
that's my it could be many other reasons but i that's again mm. it could it could have also just been again maybe maybe there's because again I, I didn't especially in the beginning of the season i was just winning a lot of games the mm. sample size it could have just been some like mental buff where i had where like i won a lot same similar to this and then suddenly now this now i'm actually now i'm try hard on this account so it could have been initially low mm. expectations and then try hard in mm. But I think for her, it's a little bit different because she actually streams, I think. Yeah, the streaming was She's legit streaming. So she, she streams. And so like, she streams these games yeah, on this account. Yeah, that's what, it, that's what the email said, And she's still right? high. Like, yeah. You play worse on stream. That's what I'm like, saying. I, that's I, so fascinating it's a, to me. It's a very interesting case. So I think she's onto something, though. I think on her main account, I think she's definitely doing some self-sabotaging behavior there. And maybe it's similar to the previous email where they're making a massive deal out of the block. It's like, here we go, strap yourself in. Hmm. You got your three block. You're gonna, you know, you better be quite a great high intensity. But you know how we've had this, we had this discussion on another episode where, you know, sometimes you play better on 95% intensity rather than 100% intensity. Like taking your foot off the gas that little bit and lower and just like being a little bit more, less intense and less jacked up about just winning this, these, these games or at least trying your best. Because, like, the more you give, the more painful it is when things go wrong, right? Like, if you're giving your absolute all, for the, for the majority of people listening, they get really annoyed when things don't go right, right? Because they, they know they're giving their all. They want to get they want to get the results, I guess, for that, for that game. Um, so, yeah, I think it's similar to the previous email where they make... I think she's probably, whether it's consciously or subconsciously, making a massive deal out of her yep. intense block that's putting added pressure onto herself... And that's leading to her performing worse on her main account. I think that has to be the case. Yeah. Expectations, too much pressure. The The idea of intensity maybe is, yeah, just overwhelming. Because I think what people do, Nathan, is people conflate intensity with results. Yeah, like results. Or specifically in a game, they think they have to do crazy things as well. Yeah. I think when they say intensity, I'm like, I'm like running around solo killing everyone. But that's not how League works. We know that's not how the game works. That's right. And I think as well, like you know, this second account here shows that when you're just trusting your instincts, going with your intuition, you know, you're, you're still trying to win, but not like super intense. Um, you know, you, you have really good quality intuition. You have really good understanding of your limits and that's what's happening here. Your this second account is just the manifestation of you express. It's like your baseline into intuitive play. Well, she said she picked master before, right? Yeah. So this main. is just getting to a skill level. This is getting to a skill yeah. level. That's right. But like, yeah, maybe, maybe you, again, maybe you're not actually playing that intense yet and you're going to get stuck. You'll maybe go back to diamond in the next couple of games. Potentially. potentially. Right. Again, that's what I'm saying. Maybe you get tricked. You get tricked with these accounts. So you tricked. Think. Swan smash really, really Sample easily. size. Yeah. Exactly. It, it could be so a combination well. again of a bit of luck. Things just going your way. And as well as like, again, playing at your level just at your level yeah i don't think she's playing above her level whatsoever no. i think that is her level or well, specifically it is her intuitive level that's like what happens if you just play express your best self see what happens that's exactly the the rank that you'll get very interesting i mean in terms of feedback nathan in terms of how she can deal with that i mean i think it just ties into you need to really you need to calm down a little bit i guess on your main account you need to just come I, in with my yeah my Take this advice and you need to fix this account. Stop playing on this master account, honestly. That would be my advice. Advice. You need right, to literally straight up. Straight up it. ditch it. No, but, but, but she streams. But she streams. Oh, she streams on that account. Yeah. So I think it's unavoidable. Okay, well, whatever you want to do then. That's my <laughs> advice. Cut, I'll say cut the streaming as well. Cut the streaming. Well, I, I think honestly, my advice is the same advice I gave to the, the previous email, which was... You have to have that 0.01% learning mindset where it's not every, or even do the iceberg thing that we spoke about. It's like, okay, well, in those games where you're feeling really frustrated or getting tilted, why? Like go down the layers. Okay, why does this, why does this game feel like it's do or die? Why? And go further down, further down, further down, and then really be honest with yourself. I think there's, I think there's some introspection that she needs to do. I think there's probably, again, the iceberg is a lot bigger than it appears. I think there's, that's probably the case. And I think probably what it ties into is, she has a lot of people who f probably follow her climb and are watching her account. She probably has expectations or other, I guess, external factors that are impeding her journey. And I think there's some tough questions. She needs to have that tough conversation with herself. I think that's really the, 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 the solution here. So I think we're just scraping the surface to be honest. I think what we're looking at here is the tip of the iceberg. Exactly like that, that, that comment before. Agreed. All right, our last one here we'll do. This is a we love our success stories, Curtis. Yep. So we'll do a success story here. This one's from Nathan. 
title of this email is hey hello coach i oh, sorry. the title is email did you write this one in nathan mm, yeah well, this could be literally a paid actor <laughs> idea no this is uh the title of this one is just thank you all right hello Co- coach curtis and nathan mott my name is nathan and i've been <laughs> listening to your podcast since the middle of season 11 during my large break from the game when a friend of mine introduced me to it the main punchline for this email is this my life has changed for the better and it's thanks to my wife and you guys. And writing this email is another step in my journey of self-improvement. A little bit of background. I'm 29 years old. I'm married, work a full-time night shift job where I listen to this podcast. Um, every BBC episode he says he's listened to. I grew up playing video games and multiple sports. I've always struggled immensely in school and I have ADHD. Maybe this is important to note, but throughout my entire journey, I've been playing a combination of Timo, who is my one trick currently. Trinomia, Fiora, and Nasus, who I haven't played since Season 8. I've been playing League since March of 2014, um, nearing the end of my college semester when my two best friends introduced me to the game. Um, And I immediately got hooked. I played an absurd amount of games with my friends mostly, having fun but further destroying my grades. I hopped into ranked for the first time near the end of the season, playing about 50 games and ending in Bronze 2. So that was Season 4. Same story for Season 5 and 6, except I will play enough games to get into Silver and then stop. Season 7 was the first time I made an attempt to take the game seriously, where I had the goal of getting into Gold. I ended up in Gold 3 playing only about 100 games. Season 8 had the goal of getting Platinum, but after failing my promos into Gold 1 three times and losing 15 games in a row, I gave up for the season, but again only after 100 games. Season 9 is when I started uh, playing Trinomia, and after only playing 210 games or so, I got to Diamond 4. My ego was at an all-time high, of course, but I did but I did know that I still knew nothing about the game, but this is also where I hit my lowest point. I had extremely toxic expectations for myself, always putting myself down, cursing myself for being bad at the game, and not being able to climb any higher. My relationships with other people and myself were deteriorating. Seasons 10 and 11, I hardly played the game, only about 50 games in season 10, where I had unreasonably high expectations, and in season 11, I took a big break from the game to play other games and improve myself. My wife, at the time girlfriend, who has worked with people with all sorts of mental disorders and disabilities, had eventually convinced me to talk to my doctor about ADHD, and he agreed that yes, I do have it, so in August 2020, I got medicated. Season 11 is when my improvement journey began with my large break from the game. The time away from the game took a huge weight off my shoulders and came back to the game in season 12 with a clean slate, ready and excited to play the game again. I had a loose goal of getting platinum that year and placed in gold too. I was reviewing my games to the best of my ability and being curious about the game thanks to my break in season 11. And your early episodes about managing expectations and accepting your level of play. I played just about 440 games and went from gold two all the way to gold two. And I had an absolute blast for the first time and it was a game changer. I was okay with my rank. The toxic expectations that I put on myself and so many other people put on themselves were pretty much gone. Even though it was lower than in previous seasons, I didn't care. I just enjoyed the game and the improvement process. Currently, I'm ranked Platinum 1, hoping to get Emerald before the end of the season, but I'm at peace with the knowledge that I might not. I have not achieved some kind of perfect bliss or tranquility with the game. There are still some games that I don't review and times when I still get frustrated by a certain matchup. Days where I don't make enough time to get a block in, but that's okay. I'm still improving my process and getting better at it very slowly. For what seems like the first time in my life, or at least in many years, I am happy and look forward to my future as a whole, hoping to one day get to Master Tier. No matter what challenges I will face, I'll be able to take them on thanks to your lessons. Once again, thank you guys so much. I look forward to the next time I write in. They're my favorite success stories because it's not about a fancy rank. It's not about a fancy achievement. It's about this mindset shift and he's just genuinely a happier guy. Enjoying the game more. Enjoying the game more, better relationship with the game. And and I would say just more, he just seems more content, you know, and it's not really a matter of if he gets some massive achievement or it's even not about when. The rank, it's not about the rank, it's about his relationship with the game yeah. and the time that he's putting in. Is he enjoying the time that he's putting into the game? He's enjoying the game more going from gold two to gold two than so it was So gold, that. was it gold three to gold two, was it? No, it was just gold two to gold oh, two. He, he didn't, didn't go anywhere. Go anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. And compared to when he was diamond four and just, his life was turning into ruin. And that's what this podcast is all about, right? And it's about developing a healthy relationship with the game. It's about being honest with yourself, having that tough conversation. And um, it seems like he's really turned 
the corner for the better. And he just seems like, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, that's, I think that's, that's what this podcast is all about. Really. I love these stories of like these long-term players, dude. Like season four, he's been playing for what? How many years? But they're the, they're the hardest to change. Yes. they're very. I think a lot of people listening to this wouldn't actually even appreciate how difficult it is what he's done. For those people that have played for the game for over like eight years, it is so, and especially if you've achieved a high rank in the past of, di of diamond and you've gone back to gold, you know how hard it is to be at peace. For your ego. You know, to, to be at peace with, like to come to terms with the idea that you're now a genuine gold player sends people mad. Hmm. That, say, that, though, that, that recipe, that's like a recipe for disaster right there. There are many, 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 many people that would never come out of that. They, they would be stuck in their ways. They would have a miserable relationship with the game. They would either be addicted and or complaining on Reddit about how shit league is 24-7. They'd be, you know, writing and complaining about losers Q, Elo Hell, teammates, blah, blah, blah. But he's, you know, he, he, he's got that growth mindset. He's chipping away. He's doing it in his own time. He's having a crack and he's, most importantly, he's having fun with it. Think about how crazy that is. If he's to have, imagine if he was to have a conversation with his previous self. So in a couple of years, they wouldn't even be on enjoying the game, and he's like diamond. Four, they wouldn't yeah. even be on the same wavelength. No. They would. It's like legit two differing people, mm. you know. And I think that's just so inspiring. And there are many people that need to hear that and that it is possible. Though there's people that, are, especially the long term league players, it's an incredibly impressive feat. It'll be very interesting to hear from him again in another maybe another year. See, see how progress. he's going. Yeah, see how he's chipping away. All right, that's it for today's mailbag. Then beautiful. Any final words, Curtis? Any, any um, to wrap us up? So when we're recording this, by the way, we the World Finals hasn't... That's right. Yeah, so you might be thinking, well, what are your thoughts on Worlds? We'll do that next episode. So I want Faker to win. That's it. That's all I'm going to say. Yeah, I think everyone's rooting for Faker, Curtis. Got to root for Faker. Yeah. T1. T1 That will be way. his fourth World Championship. Is it fourth or third? So fourth. he won season, season two, season three. So he won season three. And then... Season four. Doing. Did you win season four? Right, I'm looking this up. How many worlds is Faker won? This is embarrassing, Nathan. Yeah, I know. I'm pretty sure my guess is three. Here we go. Yeah, he's three. won three. Yeah, so this could be this will be his fourth. Wow. If he was to win, but it'd be on finals he's been in though. He's been in what seven finals, six finals. Yeah, it was even even last year. Last year. And then when he lost to Samsung as well. <laughs> <laughs> insane the goat Insanity. of the legends all right so we're looking forward to that on yep. sunday yep keep on improving guys three block process we'll see you guys next week